Hi, everyone. I'm Quinn. I lead events and experiences at Ginkgo. And I'm Grace, the creative director of Grow, Ginkgo's magazine. And we could not be more thrilled to welcome you to the final hour of stage programming here at Ferment, a collaboration between Grow and Pop-Up Magazine. Today at Ferment, you've been hearing all about what we're building at Ginkgo, what people are engineering on our platform, and what innovation in biotechnology means for health, manufacturing, and the climate. Grow is where we get to explore those possibilities of biology further through storytelling. It's a place where we bring together diverse voices to think about the values that drive synthetic biology and how those values can drive positive change for our futures. If you haven't grabbed a copy of our latest issue yet, you can do so in the library upstairs and read some of those stories in print. This year, we're taking it up a notch by bringing stories from Grow Magazine to life live on stage. We've teamed up with the best storytellers around, Pop-Up Magazine. For over a decade, Pop-Up has been producing stories performed alongside animation, illustra animated illustration and accompanied by an original score. If you're not familiar with Pop-Up, whose shows are routinely sold out, you're in for a treat. Today, you'll be hearing four stories that have been published in Grow. To start, Nadia Berenstein will survey how to make lab-grown seafood delicious. Alexa Garcia, inspired by Baranda Montgomery's work, will share with us what plants can teach us about equity. Next, Claire Evans will meditate on what it means to approach organisms with empathy and care. And finally, Sudeep Argawala will ponder synthesizing the world's holiest fragrance and what that could mean for us all. You should all have an envelope for a final story. Please wait for our cue to open it. We hope these stories inspire you, challenge you, and encourage you to ask, what if we could grow everything? And with that, we'll pass the mic to our first storyteller. As a reminder, this is a performance, so we would love if you could keep your voices down and phones off so we can all enjoy the full experience. We hope you enjoy the show. My friend, the journalist Larissa Zimbaroff, is what you might call an adventurous eater. There's plant cell cultured chocolate where they're actually culturing the cacao cells. Okay, so I tried that. It wasn't that good. Um, but I've tried deli meats and turkey cutlets that aren't made from turkey but are made from mycelium, which are the underground root network of mushrooms. When Larissa has a bagel with a schmear, the cream cheese comes from protein derived from extremophile microbes that grow in geysers at Yellowstone. I've tried algae in various formats. I've tried duckweed, which is also called lemna. It's a single cell organism, and the duckweed, they tell me, makes a great egg replacer. The protein, pond scum, is being turned into um, an egg or an egg white or a protein that makes a macaron or makes a pound cake. Larissa has become one of the world's few connoisseurs of future food in its beta testing stage, lab to table cuisine. And so last March, when Wild Type invited her to their tasting room to sample sushi grade salmon grown from immortalized coho cells, she was down. San Francisco-based wild type is a leader in the cell-cultured seafood space. Their salmon is not available to the public, not yet. No cell-based meat is. But the FDA has already given a thumbs up to two companies growing chicken from scratch. And wild type is one of more than a dozen companies racing to bring cell-cultured seafood to a dinner table near you. Now, if you're imagining a slice of lox served fresh from the Petri dish, let me set the scene. There's a chef, first of all. Larissa recognized her right away from the last season of Top Chef. And she's showcased wild-type salmon in three elegant presentations on a slice of toasted brioche with creme fraiche and herbs, served ceviche style with a dash of citrus, 
and minced and spicy, like the inside of a salmon roll. Wild Type's founders and staff looked on as she dug in. This was a supercharged version of the classic critic visits the restaurant scene we, we know from movies like Big Night or Chef, except that in this case, the meal in question took years of research and millions of dollars to produce. I got very excited and, you know, kind of like very eager to sit down and try these things. Before we got to what it tasted like, why would anyone want to grow salmon from cells? According to the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, more than a third of the world's marine fisheries are in danger of collapse. Popular fish like Atlantic cod, swordfish, Chilean sea bass, and bluefin tuna are particularly threatened. And rising levels of heavy metals and other contaminants like microplastics make, make eating certain kinds of fish a risky prospect. But this hasn't stopped us from chowing down on fish sticks and tuna rolls. In fact, global seafood consumption more than doubled between 1990 and 2018. The hopeful pioneers of cell-cultured seafood promise a bounty of fish, shellfish, and crustaceans, free of toxic pollutants with a fraction of the environmental impact and no animal suffering. But this plan only works if people want to eat the stuff. You might expect salmon cells grown in a bioreactor to taste a lot like, well, ordinary salmon. After all, the cells used in cell egg come from real living fish. Same cells, same genes, same flavor, right? But flavor isn't just an expression of DNA. It's also a reflection of the life lived by an animal before it became our food. Flavor tells the story of the journey from planet to plate. Wine people out there may know the schmancy word terroir. That's French for taste of place, and it refers to the way the land and labor of a specific region shape our experience of the flavors in the glass. The terroir concept has spread from the wine world to encompass all kinds of things, from clams to cannabis. So where does that leave cell-cultured seafood, which is grown in sterile vats designed to be scalable, standardizable, and deployable everywhere? Is there such a thing as laboratory terroir? First things first, how do you build a fish from cells good enough to feed a planet of hungry human pescivores? So I'm David Kaplan, a professor uh, in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Tufts University in Boston. Dr. Kaplan and his students are developing the technologies and techniques to cultivate and grow seafood and shellfish, which still remains a couple of steps behind cell culturing terrestrial animals. A big challenge for researchers working on culturing seafood is our wide-ranging voraciousness for all of the fruity di mare, the manifold and motley fruits of the sea, hundreds of species of vertebrate fish, as well as invertebrates like oysters and octopuses. Compare that with pork. Sure, there are different breeds out there, but bacon and chops all come from the same kind of animal. Not so for salmon and cod, or lobster and eel. The processes we use for fish are very, very different than what we use for terrestrial animals, like for cows and pigs and chickens. Um, and so every time we, we look to isolate and grow cells from different fish species, it's really uh, almost starting over. To recreate something, you must know it intimately. Establishing new cell lines often means getting on a boat and going fishing. We do a muscle biopsy, you know, right there on the boat to try and isolate cells from the fresh tissue. One time... Seas were very rough and none of us were well equipped. Um, some people took Dramamine, which was smart. I've been on boats my whole life, so I didn't think I needed it, but I was wrong. An epic bout of seasickness. 
It was so worth it, though. Kaplan and his colleagues caught a mackerel that day that they successfully immortalized. Was it the tastiest mackerel that ever did swim in the cold, cold waters off Massachusetts Bay? Who knows? When I began researching this story, I dreamed about endless rivers of salmon cultured from the cells of prize-winning fish, about the possibility of mass-cultivating toro from the tastiest tuna sold at Tsukiji Market. I imagined that the fish bequeathing their cells to our cell-cultured future would be chosen in part for their deliciousness. I soon learned that taste is not a primary concern when selecting specimens for cell lines. Researchers like Kathleen are looking for cells that are good performers and good team players, not flavor bombs. Think about it this way. When we take a bite of fish, we're consuming different kinds of cells, muscle, fat, connective tissues, arrayed together in accordance with the vital requirements of the species. Think of the flakiness of grilled sea bass, the way the fillet separates into layers with the gentlest prod of a fork. The sea bass's body grows like this so that it can live, but it won't grow this way unassisted in a bioreactor. Producers of cell-cultured seafood must find ways to recreate or mimic the three-dimensional arrangements of cells. This has to come first. The cellular architecture that produces texture is the framework for flavor. Which brings me back to Larissa and her epic taste test. The bite and the chew was, I didn't feel, I felt like I was biting more into like uh, some kind of gelatin based product than a muscle based product. I thought, if we eat with our eyes, that visually it's, it's good enough and it's there. I think if someone's gonna try it plain, like me, they're not gonna see it working yet. But I think like in a poke experience, I think it might be great. The look was right on, but the texture wasn't quite ready for prime time. I thought the flavor was very mild, super, super mild without any kind of fishiness. And both founders said that that was because I actually didn't know what fresh fish tasted like because I never get to taste fresh salmon. The seafood we eat now is often far removed from its place of origin, whether wild caught or farmed, and is almost certainly frozen at some point. Even fish bought right off the boat at a dockside market may have been captured weeks earlier. But if cell-cultured seafood becomes a reality, seafood could be produced anywhere. This could radically change the landscape of food production. Someday, a prairie oyster grown in bioreactors in landlocked Oklahoma may be as fresh as any well fleet slurped at a Cape Cod clam bake. So let's say companies like Wild Type get the texture and taste of cell cultured seafood to be indistinguishable from the real thing. Well, what is the taste of the real thing? The oceans are changing because of climate change and other anthropogenic factors. So the fish of the near future may not taste quite like the ones we nosh on today. And there's another thing that can change. Our appetites and our desires, our sense of what tastes good. Deliciousness isn't just a matter of flavor profiles. It's also social and cultural. What makes food good to us is shaped by what we know about the food, where it comes from, how it's made, by our values. So maybe we have to recalibrate our expectations and learn to savor the unplaceable freshness of laboratory terroir and entirely new taste experiences too. There is no other option, technological option I know of, if you want fish-like food that's healthy, high quality, and safe than going to a cellular agricultural approach. And the beautiful thing here is you not only can isolate cells from fish people know about and eat today, 
but you can isolate cells from even fish that have become, you know, difficult to raise, uh, rare, used to be commonplace, now aren't. You're worried about fish stocks. You know, you can you can isolate cells from any of these fish and start to create foods that are even expand the palate further. And at that point, there's no limit. No limit. How to get there? It's a question for another day. And this is the promise and the pitfall of food futurism. The spoils of the distant future are sometimes much more enticing than the struggles required to attain them. Thank you. Back in 2020, I was getting a PhD, studying insect guts and pioneering genetic engineering techniques that could someday save our world from plastic pollution. We just learned that the humble mealworm could digest, biodegrade, and even subsist on plastic a surprising yet potentially transformative capability in an insect whose most popular use to date was as fishing bait. At least, those were my high hopes. But the arrival of a global pandemic meant that I couldn't go into the lab, and my precious mealworms withered while we all waited for return to normal that never came. That's when I turned to gardening. I started with a single succulent. I figured it would be hard to kill. Within four months, I was the proud steward of two jalapeno plants, a lime tree, six marijuana plants, a wide assortment of herbs, countless cacti, and a cute little strawberry bush. I spent every morning out on my tiny balcony admiring the greenery. That strange summer, under the pervasive threats of respiratory illness, police brutality, and all-consuming pessimism, I found solace in my garden. It's easier than ever to feel alienated from our work and from each other. More and more remote work and productivity apps are muddying the lines between our personal and our professional lives. But gardening is the opposite of all of that. It's dirt and water, sun and seed. It's rooted in reality. There's a direct connection between what you put into it and what you get out of it. And it begins with close observation. You monitor the plants as they grow. And when things start to go awry, like wilting leaves or an infestation of pests, you don't blame the plants, you intervene. Maybe they need a sunnier spot or more water. For a plant to thrive, it's the gardener's job to make sure the environment is suited to its success. Sadly, when it comes to humans thriving, we often forget to consider the impact of the environment. And this is true in a lot of communities, but especially in STEM, academia and industry. So my own gardening practice is one driven more by my um, desire to interact with plants than it is to have a bountiful garden. That's Bronda L. Montgomery, a biologist, author, and avid gardener. She spent a lot of time thinking about what society can learn from the natural world. She wrote about it for Grow. In the U.S., there is an indigenous farming practice that I've been deeply inspired by, not to co-opt the story, but deeply inspired by, which is the Three Sisters, um, where corn, bean, and squash are grown together. And this is an example where these are plants that have complementary growth patterns. So corn grows tall, bean is a vine, it grows around the corn using the corn for support. But the bean is a, in, a, in the family of nitrogen-fixing plants, where it can take um, atmospheric nitrogen and convert it through chemical processes into 
into a chemical fertilizer that supports its growth, but also supports the corn that it's growing with. And then traditionally, um, in the indigenous farming practices in North America, the third sister is squash, which grows low to the ground and kind of serves as a ground cover to keep the ground moist, keep out weeds. Um, and so each of those plants has a different role. And it's been known for many years in indigenous farming communities that they grow better together. And the opposite of that? So monoculture really is this idea of having a single type of plant that has a single type of behavior, a single type of fruit that's produced as the uh, predominant species in a field. And I think part of what we see is that for many years that we've had a kind of a monoculture of white males in sciences. Approximately two thirds of the workers in STEM are white. Black, indigenous, and Latinx people are all severely underrepresented, and the workforce only gets more blindingly white the closer you get to the boardroom. So the biggest consequence is that diversity of thought, diversity of opinion um, is really needed to solve complex questions. And when you have a single mindset, even if you can think that thing through very clearly, you're thinking it through from a single perspective. And so our ability to get at new answers, new perspectives, new inputs is limited when we have a limited um, number of individuals that are at the table. The cost of this monoculture has never been clearer. Take the case of pulse oximeters. For decades, white scientists have known and ignored the fact that these devices, which monitor the oxygen level in our blood, don't work accurately on darker skin. COVID brought this fact to light and more. Throughout the pandemic, America's long history of biomedical racism and the long-standing underrepresentation of Black, Indigenous, and Latinx people in STEM has led to bad health, lack of access to quality health care, and in some cases, to an understandable distrust of public science. Now, a few Black scientists in their labs are working to improve pulse oximeter technology, which in turn could ultimately improve health outcomes and survival rates for all melanated people. There's so much more we can do in the right environments. Throughout my time in academia, I've worked on diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. At MIT, I was an undergraduate ambassador for recruiting underrepresented minority students. During graduate school at Stanford, it was much the same, recruiting, advocating to professors and administrators, speaking on panels. I was pursuing my PhD with plans of becoming a professor and mentoring other black students to success. But when I asked the one black woman of prof uh, in professor of engineering for career advice, she said, well, you'll experience discrimination, but that's always expected. By the end of 2020, after a rewarding and fruitful season in my garden, I no longer wanted to expect discrimination or isolation or work unrewarded. I wanted better. In STEM, a few minorities are introduced into a monoculture and expected to thrive. When they don't, well, it must be their fault. And I think too frequently what we do is try to bring a diverse set of individuals in and mentor them how they fit to the environment as opposed to using mentoring to understand the relationship between individuals and the environment. What if, as Baranda suggests, we approach the STEM monoculture with the same care and attention that we give to our struggling gardens? There are widespread benefits to breaking up monocultures. There is evidence that there's more creativity and more productivity when you have a diverse set of individuals, in addition to the moral uh, principle of providing spaces for all who would like to be involved in the scientific community. So it's not just that you're providing opportunity for people who are generally excluded. Everyone thrives better in a diverse community. A good plant caretaker knows that each member of a community has particular potentials 
and needs and fosters synergies between them. They take a growth-based perspective and refine their strategies. They talk to their community, exchanging wisdom and references. We can do this in STEM. It will require some changes. Our current structures are not set up to recognize and reward individuals who approach mentoring through the lens of environmental stewardship. Um, our current structures count how many students did you graduate. They count how many individuals you've helped publish papers who get grants. It doesn't necessarily mean that you've done good mentoring. So I think that the biggest structural change that has to happen is we have to shift from only focusing on what we do to how we do it. We have to ask the individuals, the students, the colleagues who were involved, were you treated well? Or did you get to grow as a professional and a person as this was produced? And so I do think that one of the reasons I have started to think of mentoring and leadership as environmental stewardship is that we have to say that we're taking care of the environments in which people do their work, even as we're questioning and judging and quantifying what work was accomplished in those environments. Gardening taught me to expect more from the people and institutions around me. Whether I'm working in the dirt or the lab or the office, I am always seeking to build the supportive environment I desire. A polyculture that not only allows, but encourages everyone, truly everyone, to thrive. Thank you. It's two in the morning, and at the University of Toronto, a postdoctoral researcher named Debelina Roy is still awake. Her job involves culturing rat neurons. It's demanding work. The cells can be finicky, and they need to be monitored closely. In fact, Debelina has to check in on them every six hours, which is why she's still here in the lab in the middle of the night. My own body was living to the rhythm of these neurons because I had to get up in the middle of the night, get down to the lab. See, rat cells multiply quickly. And so to keep the lab from swimming in them, Debelina has to regularly cull and dispose of extra cells. That is to say, she has to kill some. It's a routine process called subculturing. But tonight, something not so routine happens. It's like a 2 a.m. I'm like, what am I doing? A biologist is supposed to stand at some remove from her subjects in the lab. But Debelina, in that moment, realizes that her relationship with these cells is not one-sided. The cycles of their lives are regulating her own life, too. She's acting on the cells, yeah, but they're acting on her as well. And now she's just about to kill them, just like that. You know, like, it was a real moment, like, who is doing what to whom, and... She hesitated, holding the incubator door. It's just a pause, but a meaningful one. Because after it passes, Debelina realized that she will never look at cells the same way again. Debelina Roy is not the first scientist to feel so deeply connected to her lab subjects. In the 1920s, a young cytogeneticist named Barbara McClintock appeared on the scene. She spent 50 years studying corn and was known for observing her specimens very, very closely. McClintock could pick up on even the most minute changes in each of her plants. She chastised other scientists for attempting to impose an answer on their subjects. She preferred to let the answers come to her through careful, sustained observation. It was slow, but fruitful. Although marginalized for half a century, her landmark work ultimately proved the chromosomal basis of genetics, earning her a Nobel Prize in 1983. What McClintock understood about her role as a scientist was this. 
the closer and more willingly you look at the world, the more it allows you to see. McClintock called this approach developing a feeling for the organism. And for her, nurturing that feeling was an essential part of being a good scientist. McClintock's extraordinary sensitivity earned her a reputation as a mystic. She believed that all life is interdependent and interconnected. This understanding has long been part of indigenous views of the world, but it was and continues to be neglected in many of the sciences. Debelina Roy wants to change that. That early morning experience in the lab with those rat cells, it led her to propose an entirely different scientific philosophy. One that builds on McClintock's feeling for the organism. It's one that opens up new avenues for research and could, in the process, make us more humane. In the lab, scientists form reciprocal arrangements with cells. They provide or withhold those conditions that allow life to thrive. In turn, the cells reveal their behavior under novel circumstances. This is a relationship, but is it a healthy one? Some feminist scholars, like Debelina Roy, have argued that the Western scientific worldview is rooted in the idea that we can control and subjugate an unfeeling world. And indeed, foundational thinkers in the history of science, like Francis Bacon, who wrote about enslaving nature to the service of man, and Rene Descartes, who once compared the cries of a wounded dog to the sound of an improperly functioning machine, they've cast a long shadow. But could we step away from this shadow and shine a light on a new, more equitable path? Debelina Roy thinks so, but only if we can move away from that impulse to dominate. I guess my goal is to just take us down a couple of notches, <laughs> kind of uh, moving that human from that space of authority hierarchy, or just this is the viewpoint that we need to think from only ever, right? She believes that this worldview creates hierarchies where they don't exist in nature. Instead, Debelina proposes that we place ourselves along a continuous plane, human and non-human alike. After all, we're different from cells, but we're also made of cells. We are life acting on itself. And shifting our perspective in this way, it seems like a small act, but it could have an outsized effect on the advancements that happen in science labs. I think that if we reorient ourselves, that might change how we ask scientific questions, which questions we ask, what we think we can use as raw material and extract labor from, or who, you know? Those encounters can sometimes kill. I think we need to reorient ourselves to, like, who gets to live and who doesn't. Who's to say that the humans are the only ones that need to thrive? making an effort to feel for organisms in their fullness isn't only a philosophical position. Cozying up to the small things has its practical advantages, too. Yep, bacteria run this planet. They run this planet. Yeah, we, we just need to get on board, that's all. Sarah Richardson is a molecular biologist. Her hope is that humankind and bacteria can work together to produce useful materials, break down waste, and ultimately save the world. For example, she hopes to someday, someday train wild bacteria to convert unused biomass into petrochemicals. And to achieve these goals, Sarah and her team approach the bacteria that they work with not as subjects, but as collaborators. And that takes humility. No, I wouldn't say I'm smarter than a bacteria. I say I specialize in something different. In my lab, bacteria get anthropomorphized pretty quickly. They look picky, they look fastidious, or they look robust, they look un unfussy. They have personality. In my lab, they all get nicknames. Scientists like Sarah Richardson are showing us that there are ways of encountering the non-human world, even putting it to work for us, that emerge from a fundamental respect for life. Instead of dominance, Sarah opts for a different kind of power negotiation. It's domestication. Domestication is the secret. Like Barbara McClintock, Sarah lets the organisms speak for themselves. She studies where bacteria come from, what motivates their behaviors, and what they need in order to thrive. 
Only then does she offer them a deal. Help us, and we'll help you. If you want to succeed in bioengineering, it's easier to work with life than against it. We need their help to change the direction we're moving science in. We need their help to get us off a of petroleum standard. We need their help to remediate some of the damage we've already done to the environment. We need their help. So approaching them with a sense of arrogance no longer seems warranted. When we put our egos aside, it becomes easier to have a particular kind of empathy with the organisms that we study. Not empathy that would render us unable to experiment with them at all, but one that helps us to broker more sustainable arrangements with the non-human world. And that empathy, Sarah says, is what drives her curiosity about the organisms she studies. Domestication is not take some organism and make it do the thing you want it to do. That has never been the case. There's been no success in, say, turning a rose into a violet. Domestication is not, I have control over you. It's you and I are gonna make a pact for you to specialize more in something you already specialize in. And for me to make the deal that I'm going to protect you while you do that. It's a process we've used for centuries, from taming wild dogs to transforming maize into corn. And it's still at work. You see it in McClintock's discovery of the transposon, a DNA sequence that can change its position within a genome long before the invention of genetic sequencing. Or in Roy's cell culturing method, which helped her discover new forms of communication between estrogen receptors and brain molecules. This approach is mutually beneficial, most of the time. That's why pigeons are tragic, because we, we, we made a deal with pigeons, and then we invented phones. Synthetic biologists have built their disciplines around the premise that life is a text that can be edited, rewritten, and translated by organisms. Once bacteria have performed the task we want of them, though, they're promptly discarded. But what if there was more to explore there? What about the other parts of the life of these organisms that we're not paying attention to? Debelina says it's a missed opportunity to deem our counterparts in the lab worthy of our care and attention only when they're productive. Because how we treat the microcosm is a reflection of our attitudes in the macrocosm. We've deemed some humans better than others because we've been able to appreciate what they are or what we've deemed as being important. When we question hierarchies, even at the molecular level, we're engaging in a radical act of humility. And it's one that manifests in our human relationships, too. It's the project of a lifetime for us to see ourselves as one of many. We are all carriers, in our own way, of the patterns of life. And by deliberately decentering the human perspective, we only become more humane. Thank you. I am standing in a grove of trees in northeast India. Everything around me is absurdly green. It must be the greenest place I've ever been. My ancestors are from this land, and though my parents uh, raised me far away in America, I still identify with it. I recognize certain aspects from sum uh, summers traveling in Kolkata, the vast paddies of rice and fields of jute, the fruit sold on the trees, the color of the soil, even the smell. I'm here on a work trip, inspecting trees used for perfume and incense. My mission seems preordained. Shortly after the partition of India in 1947, my Hindu grandfather changed our last name from Buddhar to the more cosmopolitan Agarwala. Agarwala, literally a peddler, Walla, of incense. Agarbuti. Somehow, I have walked into a trap set by my family two generations ago. You see, for the last 15 years, I've studied yeast biology and genetics. And now, 
I engineer yeast to produce rare flavors and fragrances that are slowly disappearing from the world. This air is still and hot, and I am comically sweaty. It's hard, but I must focus. The trees in this grove have been planted and carefully manicured so that after a few years of cultivation, they can be treated with a controlled fungal infection, which rots the wood and creates its trademark scent. A guide takes me to a bandaged tree and gently unwraps it. He cuts off a piece of wood with his pocket knife and rubs it between his palms to release some of the fragrance. It's musty, earthy, like compost. But there's a slight sharpness that's hauntingly familiar. As we wander the property, the guide tells me this tree is the only wood that was allowed to be taken from the Garden of Eden. Ashamed of their nakedness, Adam and Eve wrapped themselves in its bark during their flight from paradise. In the Hebrew Bible, the prophet Balaam says the tree was planted in Israel by God himself. The Psalms describe the coming Messiah as being anointed in the fragrance of the wood's oil. Later on, the prophet Muhammad fell in love with the same smell. To this day, its fragrance is mixed with water from the Zamzam well and is used to wash the Kaaba twice a year at the center of Al-Masjid Al-Haram, Mecca, the holiest place in all of Islam. Um, if you haven't already, I encourage you to open up your uh, envelopes. Later that afternoon, in an office next to a processing facility, I'm presented with a distilled version of the smell. The facility director opens a vial of amber liquid and, uh, since it's too precious to hand over, wafts it towards me. Is a dark, heavy musk. One that hangs in the air well after the vials have been taken away. Its scent is a conduit of revelation, the fragrance of history and myth of God and his prophets. The conspiracy birthed by my grandfather 70 years ago and carried on through my research has brought me to this place, and I understand why. I am here to recreate God's own scent in yeast. I'm young maybe six, on vacation in India with my parents. My cousins and I sneak into a sparse, tidy room that belongs to the house matriarch, the woman who raised everyone who grew up here, some of whom, like my father, moved away to start new lives in the United States. I am not supposed to be here, and my young heart is pounding. In that moment, a lasting association is made, a faint scent that turns out to be endlessly intoxicating. This is the smell we have loved for thousands of years. But will the scent I create in yeast be real? Here's what I mean. Maybe you know this story, the myth from ancient Greece. Theseus sailed to Crete with his army to slay the Minotaur, and then sailed back a hero. For generations in Athens, his ship was well-preserved. Well Every time a plank rotted or broke, it was carefully renovated until the entire ship was replaced by newer, stronger materials. Which raises the question, is that ship the same one that Theseus sailed to Crete? I'd argue that there was no ship of Theseus to begin with. As he traveled to Crete, then back, the ship was constantly changing. Either this thing we call the ship of Theseus has always been the ship of Theseus, or it never was. So back in Boston, I think about how to explain my project, not to my friends, but to God. Imagine what the elephant-headed deity Gonish would think. 
See, when he was a boy, he had a human head. But he was killed by the god Shiva in battle. His mother, grief-stricken and enraged, threatened to burn down all of creation unless her beloved boy were brought back to life. She demanded that he be made immortal and worshipped as a god. Shiva was chastened, immediately sending out his servants to bring the head of the first creature they encountered, an elephant. Ganesh was revived and attained immortality only after the gods spliced the elephant head onto the body of the boy. I think of Ganesh because the groves of trees that produce this beautiful fragrance are dying for reasons beyond our control. And now it is my job to identify the exact molecules that produce this fragrance. I will design snippets of DNA with encoded proteins that are capable of making this molecule. I'll synthesize that DNA and introduce it into a fungal species, the yeast that we know how to manipulate. And I'll coax it to produce the same fragrance down to the molecule of the perfume that pleased God from the beginning. But instead of living in the plants that God himself planted, it will come from this new yeast organism that I have created, grown by the leader, thousands of leader, in gleaming steel fermentation vessels. I should confess, I didn't sleep well in India, and it wasn't the jet lag. I worry that I may be taking away something important and foundational from a scent that has been dear to the world throughout its history. Even though it might all be fiction, it's impossible to say whether the plant mentioned in the Bible is the same one written in the Vedas or the same one beloved by the Prophet Muhammad. Still, this weighs on me, all of it. Is it rude that I should tell Ganesh what a burden immortality is? But there's hope. If things go well and the pieces align, I could create a new thing, a new living organism that will create the same molecules that lend the trees in India their awesome fragrance. It will survive long after the groves in Northeast India are no longer there. It has the potential to live forever. This could mean that someday we wouldn't need to mow down these splendid groves to attain their fragrance. We could divorce this oil from its various plant species, growth conditions, and processing technologies. We could democratize it so it descends from its stations among prophets and messiahs and becomes available for everyone to know and love. We could use synthetic biology to give divinity a new meaning and purpose, not for it to be hidden, but to greet and welcome us all where we stand. Thank you.